Um, welcome back to this afternoon session. So we've got a packed schedule today. So the first speaker I'll introduce is um, Dr. Christina Pozo Gonzalo from Deakin University. She's going to talk about advances in uh, sustainable batteries based on sodium and oxygen. Thank you, Christine. We can see your slides. Yep, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. I just uh, changed the title uh, a little bit, as you can see, uh, because it's the last meeting of the center. So I just wanted to to have a bit of uh, explain a little bit what it has been happening uh, during this during this uh, time uh, and where we are at the moment. So basically, so this is in this slide. Uh, I just uh, want to show. Um, a little bit evolution of the different research topics that during the during the center and how we are starting and where we are and everything obviously all the research that we have done uh, during this uh, during this time has been essential to where we are at the moment so probably you remember at the beginning we were focusing on uh, neat ionic liquids can i make change oh sorry that's not what i wanted okay can you see my mouse all right Hopefully it's all right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, thank you, Jenny. Uh, we were look, uh, working with neat electrolytes, focusing on understanding the mechanism for oxygen reduction and oxygen evolution, which is obviously essential for metal and batteries. And then uh, working with ionic liquids, mostly phosphonium and pyrrolidonium. And we look into additives and salts and the concentration and how all of these affect the mechanism. So we were working on conventional three electrode setups, something like this, a small uh, type of electrolyte uh, systems. So we move in the, then into what it will be a hub cell, something like this, I saw here in this slide, where we're starting investigating different air cathodes, just getting something that most closer will be a full uh, metal air battery. So in this case, for example, the main differences is that we were using oxygen to go through the air cathode, as opposed to what we have in here, that will, so oxygen will be solubilized in the, in the cell. Uh, and then we are starting to have more comprehensive type of studies on the electrolytes and then on the air cathodes. And that's starting with two PhD students uh, that started on the project. So, uh, for example, in the case of the electrolytes, apart from pyridonium, we also work with phosphonium more recently. And then we study a series of hybrid electrolytes, which are mixtures of ionic liquids with digla, which has given us a very good uh, results. Then when we started working on air cathodes, the first thing it was to uh, assess what it was uh, commercially available, because most of the research that is being done is more for equus media or for uh, conventional organic media, where we are working with ionic liquids. So there is always differences to get the best of these uh, air cathodes. We also work with electrospan carbon nanofibers. That's those materials have been developed within the ACES project. So I will explain a little bit more uh, about the people involved in that area. And also, for example, uh, we also work on binders, how the different binders uh, can affect the performance of the battery and what are the side uh, um, effects. So at this stage, we already started working on sodium air full uh, cells. So as you can imagine, now we have an additional unknown issue, which is sodium metal. So there is, apart from how complicated it is already the oxygen reduction reaction, we are adding the sodium metal. Initially, we started where it will be a modified coin cell. You see that we have several uh, uh, holes in one of the sides to allow the oxygen, but we move very quickly into a conventional swallow cells because it allows us to have a reservoir of oxygen and also the oxygen is uh, pressurized. And then after that, we focus on long-term cycling that that's where we are at the moment. Obviously, during the whole project, as you can imagine, other type of uh, research, uh, other collaboration has been emerging. So it hasn't been focused only about uh, metal air and sodium air batteries. Uh, but one of them that is being continuously growing and is growing, uh, uh, is still growing at the moment is uh, the research that we are doing on circular economy that is uh, involving redesign, uh, repurposing and recycling, not only to uh, batteries, so we are focusing on batteries, but also to other applications. So what I'm going to do in the next slides, because I know that um, we don't have much time, I just wanted to show a few of the um, latest uh, results. Starting and very important about, apart from the evolution of the project, the researches that we had during this time. So uh, we are starting having a Jaffe as one of the researchers. So she was a postdoc, she stayed in, in ACES for over a year. And then we have Laura and Kevin, which are the PhDs uh, working on this project that very recently submitted the, their thesis and they are, uh, they are going to be in their next um, step very soon. We also have Erlender, uh, he was an ISS member as well, uh, working on simulations 
And even that he, he moved uh, from, uh, from the King University, we still continue with the collaboration with him once he established in uh, Cambridge University. And obviously, uh, Fan Fancy has been a key uh, collaborator in, in this time in uh, getting information about speciation, solvation, and so on uh, for the metallic batteries. We also have two uh, summer students, uh, Christoph, that he was uh, started very, or he joined very early during ACES uh, from Montpellier University, and more recently we have uh, Mergen from Monash University. I have to say that many, many other researchers, so I don't, more ha don't have time to go through everybody, but I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the collaboration of Luke and Hygiene because they have been very important for all the characterism in, uh, through NMR, from the electrolytes, and also for the electrodes, and also uh, Jan Fan and Professor Songan uh, one in the air cathodes. So, some of the latest uh, results, so I mentioned Laura has been working on electrolytes for sodium and batteries. So one of the latest uh, results, it has been around this uh, cation uh, with different analysis that we can see here in this slide. And the reason behind studying this cation is because one of our researchers, Feisha, which is giving a talk uh, tomorrow, she saw a very interesting um, properties of for the sodium plating and stripping. So that was the reason behind that. And um, we studied these anions and we were practically interested in the FSI because it has been uh, published in the literature that provides a conductive and uniform SCI layer on sodium metal, and that's very essential for long-term uh, battery cycling. But it was very interesting. What we found in this case is that, as opposed to what was published in the literature, where the FSI-based ion liquids were given to irreversible oxygen reduction reaction, we saw in our case, as we can see here in this cyclobaltamogram, that oxygen was reduced uh, and then uh, this will be the oxygen reduction and superoxide, and this will be the oxygen evolution, uh, is chemically reversible. So that was already an important finding because it was the first uh, publication about FSI based ionic liquids for reversible oxygen reduction reaction. But not only that, so we have to keep investigating this specific ionic liquids and uh, on a sodium uh, oxygen full battery. This is the composition and these are the con conditions for this battery. So in this case, we saw that the battery was cycling very efficiently for around 30 cycles. And then even that the, discharge, the, charge, the charge capacity was decreasing, the discharge capacity was maintaining constant. And if we look at the efficiency, it was decreasing, but it was still in the order of 75 percentage. What is important about, about this is that this is the first paper in the literature where a sodium air battery has been cycling uh, using an ionic liquid. I didn't mention, but I mean, all of this, uh, all of this study about this ionic liquids, it has been recently published in electrochemistry communication, but I'm not going to go into much detail. So then we also work on habit electrolytes, as I mentioned, so mixing uh, pyrrolidonium ionic liquids with a dike line, basically because we wanted to get uh, other type of properties, like for example, in one hand, improve the mass transport property, or we will be an ionic liquid, and on the other hand, enhance the safety uh, related or the, the safety issues that comes from a dike line in terms of volatility and flammability. So that was a very interesting uh, work that we published uh, some work uh, last year and also this year. So for example, for the same concentration of sodium, we saw that although the discharge capacity was larger for the dike line only system, as opposed to the hybrid, if we look at the long-term cycling, then the efficiency is better for the hybrid electrolyte. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one important part of our research it has been on electrospan carbon nanofibers. It has been in collaboration with uh, Jan Fan and Professor Shungai uh, Wong as part of uh, one of the uh, Han Li, which is a PhD within ACES as well. So this strategy allows us to modify the chemical composition and also the morphology of the air cathode. As we can see here, these are flexible and they are freestanding materials. So what we have done is using again this uh, hybrid electrolyte we uh, prove or we study these air cathodes uh, for a sodium air battery. So we use both only the dike line on sodium salt and the habit electrolyte. So if we are working at 0 0.1 milliampere hours per centimeter square, we can see that both of the systems, they are very stable, they cycle for up to one cycle. However, if we increase the capacity to 0 0.25, we can see that the hybrid electrolyte is still constant. However, the hybrid 
uh, sorry, the dike line is fading very quickly. So that's already a very good, uh, still promising, better than the results we obtained with other air cathodes. So in this one, we are increase, increasing the cycling uh, close to 160 cycles overall. And this might not look like much, but if we look at the state of the art and what is published in the literature, so these are some of the values that it has been published in the, in the literature. So they order from three cycles uh, up to 100. So in our case, we are having a larger uh, cyclability. And so uh, we work on binders for, uh, for sodium air batteries as well to see the stability, the stability of the system. So we work conventional uh, PBDF, but also with PTFE and also with a polymeric uh, ionic liquids, uh, which is the polydermative side, here's the structure. So we, uh, we saw in this work that the, uh, the PBDF is unstable in the presence of the electrogenerated species that we obtain during oxygen uh, reduction. We can see here how the PBDF it turns black very quickly. However, PTFE and polydagmative side, they are more stable. Uh, also, uh, what it was important on the polydagma and PTFE, PTFE uh, contribution is that the, uh, we can see that also both of them they are stable. The polydagma uh, TFSI, the polymeric ionic liquid, has higher uh, potential, but also we can see the plateau. In general, it has more positive potential than in the case of the PTFE. So that was also published uh, this year. Uh, so that was also done in collaboration uh, with Sean uh, and uh, Luke Odell, so collaborators in this work. Um, also, uh, just to mention that um, in the case of habit electrolytes, where we are at the moment, so there was something that we wanted to investigate, and that was the role of the cation or the ionic liquids. Because we saw that there was, a, from the previous work, we saw that there was a role of the cation ionic liquid but it wasn't very sure, we weren't very sure. There was too many variables in the systems. We were comparing concentration, we were comparing a different amounts of uh, dike line with ionic liquids. So in this work that we are currently uh, finishing the manuscript, we wanted to keep the constant uh, salt concentration and then just changing the cation and in some cases the anion. So uh, what we have observed so far is that uh, they do have a role, for sure. We can see that affect the discharge capacity, the discharge capacity and the overpotential, and also the long-term stability. So just going a bit quickly, but uh, so this is still work on progress. We are finalizing the manuscript and hopefully uh, submitting it soon. So we still have uh, to finish the ACES. We still have a few manuscripts that we have to submit, so are still more, more interesting things to come. I just wanted to finish uh, just saying that uh, the announcing that I'm uh, uh, currently and the guest editor of a, a special issue on circular economy in energy storage material and send it some invitations. But please, if you are interested, just contact me. We have extended the deadline. I know that last year with the, all the COVID restriction, it has been a bit far, uh, complicated for people to submit the, the manuscript. And I'm just going to finish with some acknowledgments. Uh, first of all, at the PhD students, Laura and Kevin, uh, in all the work they put together for this uh, during ACES, and in congratulations in both of them submitting their thesis. Obviously, uh, Maria, Patrick, Doug, and Jenny, always uh, uh, very thankful to them. Professor Alan Bon as well, he's one of the supervisors from, from, Aula, from Laura, and the, our collaborators in Polymat and CIC uh, Energy Union. Um, that's all, I keep it at the 15 minutes. That's excellent. Thank you, Christina. And we have a time for a quick question. If anyone's got a question that want to type in the chat or stick your hand up, I can't see all the hands. Maybe I went a bit too quick, but yes, uh, yes, if there is anything. No, 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 so, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I had a question, but we can talk <laughs> some other time. In the interest of time, we'll move on. Thank you, Christina. That was that was very good. Um, do you do, I encourage you to, to type questions in the chat as they go along? Or, um... <laughs> I don't understand that comment, Anita. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to introduce our next talk. Um, Dr. Simon Morris de Silva uh, from Swinburne. Excuse my terrible pronunciation there. I'm sure <laughs> you can know. Um, Dr. Silva is going to talk about lubricant. Um, which those of us from Deakin know is it's a magical compound. Um, the recent <laughs> personal protein for electroactive surfaces. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if you want to pop Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. yeah. Is okay. oh, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's my slides up. Yeah. It's right around. Yep. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.
Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so I am Simon Silva, uh, a postdoc at Swinburne University. And my presentation today, I'm basically going to give an overview what I have done in the past three years in collaboration with the group. And so I would like to start the presentation by acknowledging the group that I'm working with. So we have uh, Robin and Anita from IMIT, Professor Simon Moulton from Swinburne University, but we also have Dr. Ren Greeny from Zwickenau University, and also all the students involved in these projects. And I would like to thank as well uh, Australian Research Council for the, so this research is part of the DP project, and also all, all the other collaborators that are going to talk about today. Right. Um, so, Oops, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I would start just talking a little bit about lubricin, which is a glycoprotein. And we've basically, in this uh, this past three years, we've been using the, this molecule for different applications. So that's why I call like a versatile protein or a magical molecule. So lubricin is a glycoprotein and was initially found on synovial fluids and also covering the cartilage of joints. But now uh, it's being revealed that also can be found in different parts of the body. So lubricin, when extended, has uh, around 200 nanometers, and it's basically comp uh, comprised of three domains. So we have the mucin domain, which is the central part of the protein, and then we have the two end globular domains that we call here. So the mucin domain is ha has a high glycosylated uh, part of the protein, and it's highly negative charge. So what happens when you put the lubricin in contact to a, uh, to a surface? It basically loops around and forms a loop configuration. And the two end domains comes together and then bind to the surface. So the beauty of using lubricin, because we have we have already showed that, that this molecule can adsorb and attach to different surface. And for example, here in the cartoon, I have a gold surface, but also you have shown that it can bind into ITO and carbon-based surface in a whole range of surface. So my presentation today, I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit how we can use lubricin for different applications as for example, bionic implants, and also to stabilize 2D uh, nanomaterials, and also for the point of care uh, biosensing. So when I started my job at Swinburne uh, in 2018, the first idea was investigating the role of using lubricin as anti-falling agent. So how could we could prevent falling um, as for example, from proteins in cells. So I start investigating in this case from the proteins, how it could prevent. So the first project involved was putting down lubricin on a platinum surface, which is the common material used as for example, in cochlear implants. And the results that I have here, it basically shows, uh, the first I have impedance measurement that was carried out in artificial burial leaf, which is the fluid uh, it's, that mimics the fluid uh, that's found in the cochlea. And we have basically here two measurements, which one done before the exposure to the artificial bird lymph, and then after incub incubating a surface con that contains lubricin on, on it for two hours, and then we repeat that measurement in the redox probe. So as you can see, uh, the two results is they basically sit on top of each other. So there's no difference in the impedance caused by the artificial bird lymph. And the second experiment was uh, by applying electrical stimulation protocol. That's the one used usually like for neural cell stimulation as well. And we monitor that for a period of seven days um, and which is show the results here. It showed in this bottom graph. So as you can see in red is the surface that I have the lubricin on it. And then in black is the surface that is the control. And what we're showing here is the difference in impedance. So the control surface, the impedance increases while we when you have the lubricin, it remains the same. So we start from that. And then we have Pauline, which is a PhD student. She's in her last year. She was trying to investigate if we could also use that for other materials, for example, polypyrrole. So this, that's what she did. She prepared the surface. First, she had a gold, and then she put the polypyrrole on top of the gold. And then finally, we had the lubricin surface on it. So we have here the CVs. So this is just a control. As you see in the gold, when exposed the lubricin to an artificial perilymph solution, after the exposure, and in this case, actually, she had, sorry, the BSA, there is a completely shutdown of the electrochemistry. The same thing when you have the polypyrrole. Here you have higher capacity, which is because of the, the nature of the polypyrrole. But then the redox peak or the Faraday current is completely blocked after the BSA exposure. 
But then when you have lubricin, there's no significant difference before and after exposure to, to the BSA solution. So she did a similar experiment with the electrical stimulation over, over different days. And as you see the surface that contained the lubricin, there's no significant change in the impedance while the control, just the polyprol, there's a huge difference in the impedance of the surface. So this show that lubricin can effectively prevent uh, falling of proteins. So we also had another student, which is Nat. So we're currently uh, under revisions with this manuscript. So Matt was then investigating the impact of the lubricin on cell adhesion. Uh, so in, part, in this particular case here, we are looking at fibroblasts and we are interested in fibroblasts for three reasons. First, because of their aggressive nature and also they uh, play an important role on protein, oh, sorry, on the encapsulation process of implants. And third, also because we could uh, compare with previous studies. So Matt had a similar approach as well of applying electrical simulation for that, uh, for those surfaces that contain the cell culture in there. And we had two different configurations. We basically have a control, which was just uh, a bare electrode, a bare gold. And then you have one surface with recombinant lubricin. And lubricin is also found on this, um, the cartilage in in combination sometimes with uh, hyaluronic acid. Uh, so that's why we do a combination between HA and also lubricin. So as you can see here, the surface of lubricin, even after stimulation, there's no cell adhesion on that surface, but also when you have the combination with the HA. So that shows as well that lubricin could also be used to prevent, uh, uh, to prevent the adhesions of cells in implants. So that's where we start. Uh, and then we start to investigate how could you use lubricin as well to stabilize uh, 2D nanomaterials um, in concentrated electrolytes and also complex fluids. So the, the, uh, the procedure to prepare the surface is quite simple. We basically mis mix the 2D nanomaterials with the lubricin solution, and then we have the final product. So this is how it looks like a little bit. So what we showed in this work was basically that the lubricin it actually stabilizes uh, the 2D nanomaterials when you compare it to the surface that doesn't contain lubricin with different solutions as for example, calcium chloride, sodium chloride, and yeah, and also complex fluids. And more important as well that the stabilization is, uh, it keeps over time. So it's not just at the instant, it's just not the wearing prepared solution, but also there's a, a time um, that the, the surface keeps stable. And then move on to the biosensors field. Uh, we'll, uh, when I moved to, to Swinburne, I came from a biosensing background and I was working with the implants, but I was al always interested in working with biosensors as well. So we tried to adapt this to using an electrochemical sensing platform. And the first approach that we showed was for the detection of uh, clonazepam. So clonazepam is a benzodiazepine that's often used uh, uh, in its common used with uh, drugs. As for some people that use uh, abuse that using together with drugs because that prolongs the, the high effect. And so there's a need to detect the clonazepam. So we develop what we call an electrochemical assay for the detection of this molecule. So it's basically a swab test. So we have a swab uh, that was uh, based on a paper. And then once you collect that swab, we have uh, basically a graphene oxide electrode that contains the lubricin layer. And we place those two together and we can perform the electrochemistry. So when you, uh, when you challenge the surface in a in a sample of saliva that contains clonazepam, basically what you get is an electrochemical response here. And that signal is uh, correlated to the concentration of the sample. So just to illustrate that, so we have here the two calibration curves. First, we have just a control where we have the carbon-based electrode without lubricin. And at the bottom, we have the carbon-based uh, electrode with the lubricin. So as you can see, uh, when you change the concentration of clonazepam, so this was basically done by spiking clonazepam in saliva. Uh, so as you can see, there's a correlation that uh, between concentration and current response. 
And you see that's linear when you have the lubricin, but it's not linear when you don't have the lubricin on the surface. And that's basically also because clonazepam, it binds to some proteins that it's found in saliva. And here I just show that it's, uh, in this case, was kind of specific because when you detect clonazepam in presence of other drugs that commonly interfere with that molecule, which is diazepam and midazolam, basically there's no change in signal. So it's also, uh, you show some specificity here in this sensor. So that was for the first example. But um, last year, we came with a collaboration with Universal Biosensors, which is a uh, company based in Melbourne, and they are looking to develop uh, sensing platforms. In this case, we're looking to the detection of TN antigen. So TN antigen, it's a cancer biomarkers and is expressed in more than 80% of the carcinoma. Unfortunately, as, as this is an open talk today, I cannot go into much details of the surface, uh, but basically what we're trying to do is developing a technology that can detect TN antigen directly in a fingerprint of volume. And today, in fact, I'm talking from the Universal Biosensors Company. So this is a device that we're working with. Uh, we're trying to adapt this device to using the surface that we are working on. And Universal Biosensors, they're committed to invest $13.5 million over the next five to seven years. So you can try push that to, to the markets. So this is a perfect example of how we can translate uh, ARC funded projects into a commercial partnership. And yeah, hopefully bring that to the market in the near future. And with that, I'll finish my talk here. Thank you everyone for the attention and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, that was very interesting. We have a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself. Are there any questions from the floor? Yeah, we have, we have some movement. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So Simon, with each of these applications, there's obviously still a a limited lifetime of the anti-failing performance, or is the idea is it's all really disposable type applications? Yeah. Um, so with the sensor, I can speak for the sensor because I have done experiments with that. Uh, the anti-falling lasts for around six months. That's uh, how far I have gotten with the experiments. Uh, and with the implants, uh, in the case of the platinum, we have data up to four weeks. And yeah, I didn't go further than four weeks because basically I had bacteria growth in my media. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna have six to- Six months, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so next up we have Claudia. I know her presume is gonna present from the LKM. Are you, Claudia? Yes. <laughs> Just while Claudia is getting her slides up, Claudia um, from the University of Wollongong is going to present on using dilute mixtures of hydrogen and methane for energy applications. Thank you, Jelle. Good afternoon. Uh, today I would like to uh, tell you what you can achieve with the diluted mixture of the hydrogen with the methane in the energy application, how we can extract it back this hydrogen if we want to, and actually why we did this project uh, in the first place. Power to gas uh, is a technology which uses the concept of using the excess of the renewable energy, which is produced in the low demand time, and instead of wasting, can be actually used to produce hydrogen uh, in the process of, for example, water splitting, and then the hydrogen can be later injected to the uh, existing natural uh, gas line uh, network. Uh, this is very clever uh, concept in many regards because not only increase the capacity of the existing system but also flexibility by um, having this backup of the energy and the existing uh, uh, grid can actually um, accommodate uh, provide the storage and the transport for the hydrogen and on top of this um, it is actually the perfect way for the decarbonization because hydrogen is a pure uh, energy carrier. However, there is a limitation. Uh, 
we can only introduce a small amount of the hydrogen between 5 and 10 percent uh, for the existing grid without any modification for the safety reason. Mm. <clears throat> This project is for a while, but the first country which really inject hydrogen to its grid it was uh, Germany, and uh, this, they did in 2013, and many other countries follow. And it looks like Australia is just about of this time to, to join this technology. And for us, the question arises, what else uh, can we do with this diluted hydrogen in the natural gas? And since the natural gas is mainly, mainly composed with the methane, we attempt some study to look at, at this model mixture between hydrogen and the methane. Uh, in the first attempt, we were looking, can we use this diluted blend directly to produce electricity? And uh, we use an alkaline uh, fuel cell um, with gas diffusion uh, electrodes, which were based on the, on the vortex. Uh, with relevant catalyst, and the, we look also the range of the concentration from, from the 100% to the 5% down. And as you can see from this polarization curve, actually, once you start dilute the hydrogen, the slope starts to show up on the curves and declining the, the current, and clearly for the 5% of the hydrogen at the potential of 0 0.6, and clearly the, there is a starvation uh, effect and um, the cell is not performing. Uh, however, if we target a lower current density, like 10 milliamps per centimeter square, then the cell is performing uh, quite well, and we only have to use 60 millivolt over potential to run the cell with the 5% uh, hydrogen with compared to the to the hundred percent. The second project aim uh, the hydrogen extraction. Can we have it back? And uh, currently we have three uh, existing technology which can do this. However, none of this technology can deal with such dilution. None of them can go with the dilution below 20 percent. The third one which is highlighted, this is the electrochemical uh, uh, method, which is based on the 10 uh, fuel cell membrane, which we actually follow uh, the same uh, concept. In our case, we use the same type of the fuel cell uh, device. However, we use um, acid as the electrolyte. And how this is working? You supply um, hydrogen or the blend of the hydrogen to the anode, uh, where during the oxidation, the proton is produced. The proton then diffuses to the cathode, and the mobility of the proton in, in, in acid is, is really high. And on the cathode, uh, the proton is uh, reduced, and the hydrogen is uh, is recombined. Um, you don't need much potential to drive uh, both reaction. Theoretically, even if you deal with the 5% of the mixture, you need only 76 millivolt uh, to have this process. And if you can see the monomonogram, which is recorded in our cell, the two processes, hydrogen evolution and hydrogen oxidation, are really in close uh, and, uh, together. And indeed, the first current which we can see is around 100 millivolts on the above the potential which we have hydrogen oxid oxidation reaction. We also did a, an experiment control one when we record the current when the hydrogen was flowing, and then when we switch off the hydrogen supply to the anode, and we can see clearly how the current remains to the zero, just confirming the origin of the current. Uh, in terms of the cell performance, there was no difference uh, between the concentration of 100 and 10 percent. The cell performed at, at the same level. However, for the blend of 5 percent, we can see clearly some kind of uh, uh, decline of the current and also the, the gas collection, which we have identified from the impedance spectroscopy 
that was due to the mass transfer limitation. However, you can overcome this problem if you supply more hydrogen by flowing faster. It means you can see clearly by increasing the total um, flow of the mass how the current can actually can come closer to the 100%. However, there is a catch here. Faster you flow, more you waste. Then just to have the optimum condition and just to give you the flavor of the number, which, what the cell can achieve in the one step, if we have blend of the 5% hydrogen and if we flow with the speed of one milliliter per minute, and if we target voltage of 0 0.6 volts, which the cell will operate around 100 milliamps per centimeter squared, we can extract 72% of this hydrogen with the cell efficiency of 89%. And if you would like to see a little bit more details about this two project, you can you can have a look at this two publication. And yeah, I would like to thank you all the people who were involved in this project, the funding, ACES, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Claudia. Well, we definitely have a time for a question or two. Does anybody have any questions? Jenny, so what do, you, what do you think is the biggest barrier to the practical implementation of that system? I think there shouldn't be really barrier. It seems to be some barrier. I mean, it's all the infrastructure in place. <clears throat> Uh, yes, I think I think it's maybe the need first. I think maybe with this new technology, there will be actually the need for the market of this kind of extraction in this kind of level of the dilution. And I guess you would use existing infrastructure to pipe things. Right? Yes, yes. Um, a question: When adding uh, hydrogen into gas is in a way, diluting the uh, gas. Uh, how can you compare the the caloric, uh, you know, the, the combustion of hydrogen compared to the gas? You get the same heat when diluting, or is there any limitation on that? I believe you you even even can enhance the, the caloric value because the hydrogen is is the so the same density per per volume. Yes, I will. I believe you actually can increase the, the economic value of the gas and make more cleaner. Uh, good. Any more questions from from the floor or from virtual? No. All right. Thanks very much, Claudia. That was very good. Very interesting. <laughs> Okay, next up we have the burst of sessions. Um, I'm, I'm as unclear as to how this is going to work as you are, so we'll make a start. <laughs> see how it works. <laughs> so our first speaker, because what I don't have from the program is who's where. So do we have our first speaker? So, uh, oh, great, online. So I'll ask the speakers, I'll remind the speakers that you only have five minutes total, so um, we will cut you off if you start going too long. <laughs> All right, our first speaker um, got his slides ready, well done. I'll just let you, I'll not take up your time. Um, thank you, Queen Oh uh, Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Jenny. Yeah, hello everyone. Sorry, I didn't show up in person because I didn't feel it these days. So I think it would be better for all people. Yeah, my project is about bipolar in natural activity conducting polymers for wireless cell stimulation. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, currently, the uh, neuromodulation techniques are related to the implanted uh, electrode CCD <laughs> external uh, supplies, which were led to many disadvantages like the invasiveness, infection, and the complication, and the high cost. Uh, however, the bipolar in natural chemistry uh, was so-called awareness in natural chemistry, which is a phenomenon that uh, 
uh, the redox reactions could uh, uh, work at, at the two poles of the bipolar electrode uh, electrode at the same time where the bipolar electrode is unsisted uh, to the uh, actual power uh, supply. Uh, uh, in the meanwhile, uh, current uh, re uh, research is about the conducting um, polymers on the bipolar natural chemistry is uh, demonstrated that it has the bipolar natural activity and the 72 5 voltage in organic solvent as an acid solutions and a lot of uh, research have demonstrated that the conduct polymers could have the good biocompatibility uh, compatibility and uh, could support the neural cell uh, proliferation and uh, differentiation. Therefore, the uh, bipolar in natural chemistry uh, could be the contactness and awareness method to advise the traditional and sister, uh, uh, traditional sister and wider natural. Uh, in it would be is the awareness in uh, sector for medical. Uh, medical disease. Up to now, uh, we have built up the bipolar natural chemical setting up and the bipolar natural storm meeting set up. Uh, the bipolar natural setting up has, uh, was shown like here. The cells were seated on, uh, seated on the conducting polymers per, uh, located in the middle uh, wells after applied uh, the driving voltage is uh, conducting polymers were went through the redox reaction and displaying the green color. At the same time, the cells were stimulated and uh, 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 we could uh, say the picture of cells had uh, to uh, perform the neural networks and also the uh, cardiomyocytes cells could uh, get uh, the different uh, morphology from the fibroblast morphology neck to the rooted uh, uh, neck morphology. It could be a, a uh, proved the bipolar natural stimulation would be the one stimulation to uh, modulate their behaviors. Uh, when the, the ACS the support, uh, the, the, uh, I have a, a long-term collaboration with Professor Robert Frost, uh, Frost, and in 2019, I got two months visit to transfer this one is set up and still made the cardiomyocytes under the identical conditions in uh, DCU. Uh, for more information, we welcome to the uh, two publications here. And uh, to pursue more possible collaborations and uh, extend this project, I had a one week uh, visit to, uh, to Professor Wang Shu and uh, Professor Gu Qi, yeah, uh, both are researchers in Chinese Academic of Science. Uh, addition, I did an uh, oral presentation at the Lemon World Belmont Theories Conference and uh, recently received the notification of oral presentation acceptance uh, at SAE and we'll do the oral presentation in September. Um, moreover, I received the Biorela Award and also the Emory Publication of Manson Award. Uh, overall, thanks to the SS uh, support. And in the future, I would like to work uh, uh, to work with partners that are experienced in bio Painting and bear fabrication, also expert in neuroscience and uh, clinical medicine. Uh, currently, I have already prepared to remove the solid FTO surface and get the flexible software and improve the bipolar natural active connect polymers. Also, I transfer a uh, bell electro stimulation of the nerve cells from the animal source to the human one. And also, all the, the whole bipolar electro stimulation setting up is possible. So, uh, we can do it oh. everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll press on. We maybe take some questions at the end if there's, if there's time for questions. So I believe the next three speakers are in, in person um, in, in Hong Kong. So do we have um, Grishmi um, ready to present? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. If, if you think of questions while the presentations are going, you can type them in the chat and the speakers will answer them when they are finished as well. 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Krishmi. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student here at the University of Bologna, and I'm currently working on printing quality antennas for the cochlear implants in collaboration with Cochlear Limited. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about one of my projects, which is on the interprinted spiral coil antenna for the cochlear implants. So for the contents, I will be introducing my study area and talking about the interprinted full coil and finally finish off with the demo of the printed coil. So my study area, which is the wireless energy transfer in cochlear implants. Now the figure on the left is the cochlear implant. Uh, it's a neuroprosthetic device that is surgically inserted underneath the skin and whose electrodes stretch into the inner ear or the cochlea and electrically stimulate the hair cells within the cochlea to provide the sensation of sound. Now this implant here is paired with another external unit on the right. Um, so these two units communicate with a set of transmitting and receiving antennas uh, through a radio link. Now more on how the radio link works, here's a video. So when you supply a current to a coil or an inductor, so it generates an EMF in the coil, put a second coil near it and you induce a flux which generates current in the second coil. Now the second coil and the coil within the cochlear implant antenna is, uh, the cochlear implant is actually the focus of my work. So I am printing, uh, I'm printing the coil with the inter printing method. Now this is a schematic for my work. We are using inter printing method, which is a droplet dispensing system. It uses pulse voltage to eject droplets. Um, for my purpose, we are using the PDMS, uh, which is the polydimethyl siloxane. Uh, it's a biocompatible and non-toxic polymer. So we use the sheets and then we use gold particle based ink. We print uh, the Coil antenna here, it's uh, actually loaded onto the computer with the inject printer, and the coil has actually been simulated using the MATLAB program. So, to mention the diameters of the coil, it's about uh, three centimeter, the outer diameter is about three centimeter. So, we print pixel by pixel and finally print the coil to go into detail about the printing. So, we take care of three main parameters of uh, the printer, the first of which is the drop angle. So you want the drop angle to be close to zero as possible. So in this one, uh, that's the drop view camera of the inject printer. So for that, we have a drop angle of 0.78. So with that angle and uh, the threshold uh, parameters with the voltage and pressure of uh, 5 volt and minus 20.52 millibar, we actually get a drop with a volume of 6.8 picolator. So with that, uh, you can see uh, the picture of the printed ink. Uh, so at 500 ppi resolution, you get to see all the individual droplets and each individual droplet is about 300 micron. Now, in order to make a printed line, a conducting track, you actually increase the resolution to 900 and stack the coins on top of each other. So you get a printed line. After 15 minutes of printing, you get a perfectly, print, perfectly printed coil. Um, we dry this coil again uh, for two to three hours uh, at 100 degrees, and you can see in the SAM image the gold nanoparticles have fused together, forming a solid block. The little um, holes over there, those are the solvent escape passages. Uh, so when it's drying, the solvent is actually evaporating from the ink. Um, so uh, the next thing I have is the wireless coupling with the phone charger. So the coil I designed it actually works at the frequency of your average mobile charger. So that's the mobile charger over there. We place the coil on top of that, and we have actually managed to light an LED with that. So with this coil that I've printed, it actually has an efficiency of uh, receiving 46.66% of the signal. Uh, measuring the impedance, um, the electrical parameters of the coil, we can see that it has a series inductance of 990 microhenry, a series resistance of 1.7 kilo ohm. So to conclude, we have successfully designed, printed, and wirelessly demonstrated the printed coil. At the end, I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors here in UW, Gordon, Stephen, and Shah, our industry partners, Patrick and Sophie, and my lab supervisors, Adam, Ali, and Kalani. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can even email me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we do have a question in the chat, but Vahid, I'm going to have to ask you to, to say it out loud. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Okay. What's the frequency range? Uh, it's 100 to 125. 
but it's actually uh, designed a uh, frequency independent antenna, so it should work at more than 200 kilohertz. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Jeremy. He's going to talk about 3D printing bone substitutes. Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, you uh, I'm Jeremy Dior. I'm a final year PhD student. It's doing an industry PhD with medical, uh, medical, bio, um, medical devices company, out of Melbourne, called Anatomics. And this research was funded by them and also the additive plant manufacturing training company, like Christian. Uh, so the object objective of my research was to try and fix bone-related illnesses and bone-related diseases, which currently cost the Australian government $3 billion and the American government $19 billion. Um, that's expected to increase with the aging population. Um, the current methods used to treat um, bone-related illnesses and bone-related diseases are a bit dated um, because of the co complex architecture of the skull and, and um, cranial max maximal facial implantation. So one way to circumvent this is to use additive manufacturing. So my whole project is based on a collaboration with an honest student who developed this printing platform, seen in A, and the schematic of that basically shows a powder bed fusion technology. So I've got a powder bed of a material that's scanned with a 2D cross section and all the particles fused with this laser upon heat. And that platform moves down, another platform moves up, more materials deposited on top, and then the, the laser does another pattern and it fuses to the bottom. So this platform can go into basically any laser cutter and depending on the material type and the laser wavelength, you could take a 3D printer out of it. Um, so this is the material I've, I've used for my project. It's like little stars that are about half a mil. Um, it's high density polyethylene, uh, it's biocompatible. It's approved by regulation bodies, uh, Therapeutics Good Administration and FDA. Um, it's an established material for cranium axial facial implantation and also some load bearing application when it's cross-linked. Um, it's called Starpore. It was previously called Poor Star. FDA didn't like the innuendo, they changed the name. Um, so basically I get the laser, it fuses, and the stars sort of neck and coalesce together. And that forms like a, a really porous 3D structure. Um, when compared to other market products, so one of them is called Medpore, one of them is called Starpore, and I've got Sintered Starpore. So currently it's made by basically molding it. So they put it in like whatever shape they want. They vibrate it down, they heat it up, form expands and welds in on itself, and you get a fixed porosity. 36% um, for the metaphor, 68% for the star pool, and then 82% for mine. Because it's not restricted where the laser is, the polymer moves a little bit, shrinks, air expands. I can't get that any more dense, but that surface roughness, as you can see in the, the 3D microscopy, um, is beneficial for tissue and growth and tissue infiltration. And I did it in collaboration with QUT. I did an eight week subcutaneous in vivo study in, in a rat. Um, and found that mine, my sintered scaffolds, which are way more porous, um, had an 80% tissue and growth compared to 20% and 25%. Um, mine also led to microcapillary formation. Um, the next part of my project was to make like an active star pool for the industry partner. So to integrate my like glass or different ceramics to improve the mechanical properties and potentially improve the um, inert nature of high density polyethylene. Um, that is coming along quite well, and I've actually changed a lot of my printing process to involve like a slurry based system. So that circumvents some of the um, expansion of the polymer, and I get denser and stronger constructs from that. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Any any questions for Jeremy? What's a bioactive glass? What is it? <laughs> it's a ceramic that is used as a bone substitute, basically. Yeah. So it's similar to um, my dog's appetite. Um, I can mention that next time. Probably a good idea. Okay, excellent. I think the question, and there's a question in the chat that's for um, Brittany, I think. So I believe Lee's going to uh, present from home. Is, is that right, Lee, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm presenting okay. from home. Okay, if can I can get well, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thank you. Oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. So. Great. Okay. So, hello, everybody. So, my name is Hong Kwan. I'm presenting from home because I have a cold lately. Uh, my project is mainly about machine learning for myoprosthetic hand control interface. I'm from Soft Robotics and working with Professor Gosso Alisi. Um, 
So briefly about my project is mainly about user intention prediction. We focus on uh, improving generalization capability and control position, robustness of the prosthetic hand control interface. And the second goal is um, in the interactive system, the user can learn and adapt to even the most primitive control approaches. So therefore, we user adaptation will also be considered in our project. So we employ a three-stage pipeline for pattern recognition by uh, my prosthetic hand control interface. This uh, processing pipeline consists of muscle activity detection for turning on and off the hand, uh, just a recognition for function selection and proportional regression for precision control of the terminal limbs. Uh, we did some preliminary try with uh, several people. Uh, we recorded a gesture with two different speed. We, we refer as some rough movements and fluid movement. So just a recognition was done in a simple pipeline with lean discriminant analysis and a feature of sample entropy, capture coefficient, root mean square, and waveform length. Uh, the uh, results show that most of the misclassifications tend to cluster around the transitional stages of the gesture execution. And uh, further analysis show that uh, activation of the man driven sensor was consistent across two types of movement. However, that discrepancy was observed in non-primary channel. In this case, is um, the the blue and the uh, the blue and the red channel. So, for to tackle this problem, we propose a muscle synergy by just for just a recognition. And secondly, as my previous experiment did not provide feedback for activation state of its sen of its sensors, so participant did not completely return to their relaxed state of the muscle after each execution. So this will be further avoided by in introducing an online low latency activity detection. Uh, we experimented with uh, uh, just a recognition using muscle signature and battle, work, battle feature approaches. And so far with our pipeline, we observe a small intersection recognition improvement around 6%. We are working on the muscle activity detector. So the conventional approach for detecting muscle activity has always been detecting the change in signal energy. This can either be in low pass signal envelope or using information entropy. However, it's prone to false and misdetection and require manual calibration. And we are working on unsupervised uh, muscle activity detection using here the Markov model uh, for the training phase. Uh, first, we detect the optimal change power using the general line likelihood structural test. And then we perform a uh, KME clustering to select the most representative uh, signal for to train two different hidden Markov model. So the hidden Markov model will be used to compute the uh, likelihood of the EMG sequence in the time domain without any feature extraction. And then we fuse that with the previous mentioned energy detector for detecting the onset and offset of muscle activation. And we analyzed it with uh, a few sample. And so far, this detector worked quite well, even with EMG signal as low signal to noise ratio. And we are running on the full analysis on the Nina Pro data set as well as our data sets and we'll publish it soon. And finally, I would like to thank uh, University of Wallonga as well as ACES and people at Amber for supporting with my project. And thank you everyone. Thanks Lee. Um, I have a quick question. So <laughs> can yes. you explain, I mean, the machine learning is often going to down the road be used to predict something. Is that the ultimate aim of your project? Can you just clarify what your ultimate aim is? Yes, the, so the aim is actually we build it. So although it's machine learning, but we want to have to be less robust enough so we don't have too much latency in, in the predictions. So we have to combine that machine learning as well with traditional signal processing. Yeah, so it's, it's mainly about prediction, making prediction. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? 
Okay. Thank you very much again, uh, Linda. <coughs> Linda online, and can I ask LKM to mute? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Linda, are you ready? I am. Thanks so much, Jenny. I'm just sharing my screen and put this in presentation mode. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so as per previous talks, my focus is on community renewables and uh, on the framing of actors in Germany and Australia. Uh, to recap, so there's um, more than 1,700 uh, citizen energy companies in Germany that fit the definition uh, enshrined in the German Renewable Energy Sources Act. Uh, and they're usually projects that have a cooperative governance structure uh, and that, that are made up of at least 10 natural persons as opposed to uh, major sort of shareholding companies. So uh, in Australia, um, there's uh, about 105 community energy groups um, uh, operating uh, as of present, uh, and those projects usually refer to um, projects that have at, at least two of the three um, criteria of either being owned, developed, and or benefiting local people, but there is no official legal definition in Australia um, that's enshrined in legislation. Um, and the uh, Oh, okay, the uh, research is embedded uh, in the context of a new landscape of energy services, whereby local energy markets can function as hubs for local actors to valorize their services and help balance the system. So that's the sort of de depiction on the on the uh, left here. And then within this new landscape, we have end users taking up an active role. Um, in participating in system optimization. So that's the um, picture on the, on the right here. And the question is, do go current government policies facilitate such an active end user role? And what do key policies uh, reveal about the positioning of other actors as well? And in seeking to answer those questions, uh, I'm conducting a comparative policy impact and discourse analysis that follows three steps. Uh, first, I classify policies uh, for a systematic comparison across national jurisdictions. I then conduct a qualitative discourse analysis and then use my developed framework to identify key barriers and policy gaps. And in the interest of time, I just um, won't go further into each of those steps, but I'll run you through the key findings instead. And um, in a nutshell, my analysis demonstrates that a number of government policies position key actors asymmetrically and marginalize mid-scale community renewables. And I've presented on the disproportionate focus on large scale and utility scale renewables before that kind tends to enable incumbent regime actors um, rather than community actors. Um, but this is mainly in deployment policies. Um, and I've also gone through some of the key storylines that marginalize community owned renewables in previous presentations. So I won't repeat that. Um, but the key technical and financial barriers to mid scale community renewables um, in Australia are discussed in greater detail in a co authored paper that's currently under review. Uh, with the editors of the Journal of Cleaner Production. And I hope to be able to share that with you all so that um, can sort of go into the key storylines and, and policy barriers in greater, in greater detail. Um, but in the context of system integration, there is a great potential for community-based energy services. And what are some examples maybe? And, and why, again, do I focus on community-based energy services? Well, in the context of renewable energy communities and their members, we can um, observe a highly participatory approach. And the maps early on in my presentation demonstrated a high spatial distribution um, of those projects and that automatically lends itself to a very localized approach. And so renewable energy communities are therefore arguably well equipped to facilitate the uptake, not only of new technologies, but also um, the uptake of new consumption patterns in an, in an accessible manner. So in terms of technologies, we're looking at like innovative digital services such as um, energy monitoring apps, for example, or 
um, open source collaborative tools that could enable energy performance services. And on the consumption side, we're um, looking at uh, demand side flexibility, such as optimized self-consumption that could really provide critical grid support, um, especially in high penetration areas. So overall, there's a great potential for community-based energy services, given that the participatory and localized approach of renewable communities lends itself to a very accessible translation uh, of technologies and consumption behaviors. So in summary, um, just to sort of reiterate a few points, um, I, I think as researchers, we really need to remind ourselves of the importance of having end users in mind. And that's very much in line with Eliza's point earlier from the equity and diversity discussion in a different context, of course, but very much applicable to my work as well. So um, as the share of renewables increases, policymakers and regulators are shifting their attention to system integration. And in this context, there is really an important role for local energy markets, as I said, that can serve as hubs for local actors to valorize their services and also provide system uh, support. And discourse analysis is really useful for revealing those uh, assumptions and active positioning to assess whether policies um, enable or sort of hinder that transition at the moment. And um, in, uh, in the context of um, research translation, there's really a huge potential for community focused um, end user technologies and energy services, not only in the EU, um, but also in Australia. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Very interesting, thank you, Linda. They're all silently clapping. Um, <laughs> is there any questions, Linda? Okay, people can put things in the chat if they want to. If you want to ask? Great, um, thank you. All right. Um, oh, Alexander just appeared on my screen. Excellent. Good. Our next, um, our next speaker is Alexander. Um, he's going to talk about electroactive violence for three D printing. Excellent. Good, we can see your slides. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep. You're very quiet. Oh. Yep, better? A little bit. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm here today to talk about a part of my PhD research. And the title of my presentation is a soft electroactive uh, bio ink for 3D printing based on geoma and graphene oxide. First of all, um, bio inks are defined as materials used to produce engineer or artificial leave tissues uh, using 3D printing. Uh, these inks are mostly composed of hydrogels, materials that present similarities to native tissue extracellular matrix, make these materials excellent candidates to mimic the natural solar environments, microstructure, and mechanics. More specifically, electrically conductive hydrogels uh, are highly relevant, uh, especially in tissue engineering approach, such as nervous and cardiac tissue engineering, where electrical conductivity is the key for successful function um, in native tissue physiology. In general, biomological elements are soft in a range of a few kilopascals. Uh, and human-made electronics and implants are rich materials in a range of megapascals and gigapascals, as you can see by this uh, figure on the top right side. Uh, this difference in stiffness can lead uh, to the development of inflammatory response that could decrease the efficiency of the material in general. So in this sense, the combination of materials that are capable of sustain uh, electrically conductive uh, match the stiffness of the target tissues and at the same time, able to form 3D printer structures are one of the best approaches to be studied nowadays on biofabrication. One example of hydrogel widely investigated for such purpose is uh, the gelatin metrocloyal gelma hydrogels. Here's one example of 3D printing of pure soft gelma hydrogels on the left, where in this paper, the authors develop hydrogels with stiffness between one and eight kilopascals. However, uh, hydrogels, gelma hydrogels has no conductive nature and the electrically conductive can be incorporated using carbon-based uh, materials, such as graphene oxide. Um, graphene oxide is a particular promising material that can be used to create this kind of electroactive hydrogels. Since GO uh, has some, on the electrochemical perspective, 
uh, it's favorable because of the electromobility and the high surface volume ratio. She and all in the group from the US have developed a wide research using graphene oxide in Gelma, as you can see on the right side. On these uh, papers, they show the modulation of Gelma mechanical properties where they achieve hydrogel stiffness between four and 10 kilopascals. Uh, even though all these all these results have been published, the development of 3D printed structures based in soft geoma and geohydrogels has not been reported yet. Here, I show a paper that I have recently published last month, which is based on the investigation of soft hydrogel based in geoma and graphene oxide as well, where the graphene oxide enhances the conductivity of the system and helps in the modulation of the hydrogel's mechanical properties to help in the 3D printing process. The presence of graphene oxide modulates the stiffness of the hydrogels with compression modes between 1.5 to 3.5 kilopascals, which are stiffness similar to soft tissues such as neural muscles. And also the presence of the conductive material increase the metabolic activity of the cells, as you can see on the top right figure. In this paper, you also show the printed structures based on the same composition of hydrogels and how the gel could impact this, uh, the printing process. On the bottom right side, you can see some structures of pure gel that present some failures as shown by the black arrows, uh, which might be related to the softness of the gelma. However, the presence of gel increased the shape fidelity and stability, as you can see on the last uh, line. But the most important thing to highlight here uh, on my presentation is the analysis of the current response, the analysis of the current response of gelma gel hydrogels after the printing process. On the top figure in A, uh, it shows the increase of the current response uh, when we have one and two layers of gel gel. Uh, we can see comparing the, the curves in blue and green. The green is the two layers of gel gel. As we expected, an extra layer increased the current response during the higher presence of gel. And after that, we did the same kind of electrochemical investigation, but comparing two printed layers and the same amount of gel gel hydrogels in a non-printed uh, structure. And when you compare the green and the blue line on the bottom of figure B, uh, the printed structure presents a higher current response due to a higher electrical surface, surface area available of the geo and the printed shape, which is an interesting result. So as a conclusion, uh, geo positively impacts the mechanical props of the gelmas hydrogels. The printed gelma geo also scaffolds provide the hydrogel enhanced electrochemical properties. And as a last statement, this research opened the pathways for development of a new generation of biomedical devices and materials, which requires electrical stimulation, such as the electrically controlled release of drugs or biomolecules, or even to modulate cellular behavior. So we would like to acknowledge all my supervisors, Professor Simon Mota, Dr. Simon Arais, and Professor Robert Kapsa, and also the CMD team, Dr. Anita, Kahal, and Serena. Uh, Swinburne University, the ACES in Australia with Sanchez Council as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very interesting. I'm going to jump in with a quick question, but if others have a question, put your hand up. Um, it, with your two layers, it seems like your reversibility was getting slightly better as well as your current increases. Is that correct? Do you see? Yeah. yeah? Do, why? Uh, when we have one and two layers, it's more about the, the amount of gel. Uh, we have more gel as a second layer have a higher current and the other one uh, the other comparisons are we have the same kind of quantity of gel but in the difference that when you have the printed structure you have a higher um the gel is more available to have the change of the, the electric change that's why we have a higher conductivity when it's printed in non okay all right. Thank you very much again. That was very interesting. All right. Our last presenter of the day um, is Malachi. Are you there? Certainly am. Just sharing now. Okay. Yeah. So it should be right to go. So mm -hmm. my name is Malachi. I'm a final year PhD student uh, split between the University of Wollongong and CSIRO, which is based down in Melbourne, the group. Essentially what my PhD looks at is collagen hydrogels for tissue engineering. So a lot of us will be aware of gelma um, being widely used in tissue engineering, but that's based from gelatin. What I work on is more native collagens. Um, and I really want to explain a bit about them. And I guess the core message will be to explain that not all collagens are the same. So I'll walk you through that now. So we all know hydrogels are largely you used. Just, sorry, your slides are not changing. Can you just put your talk in presentation mode and then might yeah. uh, 
right. change for us. It wasn't changing, was it? No. Um, sorry, I've got a monitor and I'll plug that in my... Is that changing? Uh, not for me. Okay. I'm yeah. still seeing your first slide. And not for and me. It's not in presentation mode, but maybe. Um... Um, it's the far right <laughs> icon. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, sorry. Apologies, Kate. Right. So, um, launching back in, we all know that uh, collagen or hydrogels rather are used commonly in uh, regenerative medicine or tissue engineering. And that's really because they create this ideal environment for 3D cell culture. It's a soft environment so cells can grow, but also rigid enough that you can make intact structures. So collagen hydrogels or collagen in general, um, I work with type one exclusively. So that accounts for about 90% of the collagen found in the body. And it's most commonly used in um, biomedical research. Um, and most often this is sourced from animals, um, really common sources from that are rat tail, porcine skin, and bovine skin. So the hallmark features of collagen and what makes it collagen is this triple helical structure as well as a repeating um, glycine uh, sequence with um, two other groups there that often um, rotate. Uh, so it has low water solubility. So most collagens that we use, we have to dissolve in weak acetic acid uh, so we have to neutralize that prior to inclusion of cells. Um, and as I've said there, once it's denatured either thermally, thermally or enzymatically, it converts to gelatin, which we're all quite familiar with. So I'll say it again, one main point here is not all collagens are the same. So the main sources in which we see are from animal, which are most commonly utilized, but also some of the newer ones we're seeing are from plant and recombinant sources. So in the animal collagens, um, as I said before, the most common sources there are rat tail, bovine, porcine, and beginning to see some marine as well. So you can extract them from a lot of different sources, that is species, but also from a lot of different tissues. So we see it extracted from tendon, skin, as well as bone. Um, and while many sources are available and um, have been extracted in literature from many, many different animals and many different tissues, not many have been translated into, um, into 3D printing or into regenerative medicine or tissue engineering. They stay as more chemistry paper where they've shown an extraction of a collagen. What we see here is that many are commercially available. So groups such as Advanced Biomatrix in America produce and supply collagens as well as some uh, functionalized form, modified forms such as methacrylated ones, which can be used with 3D printing. So the animals are definitely the most commonly used at the moment. Um, plant proteins as well have been becoming more explored that it's um, extracting collagen from plants such as seaweed. Um, and while the, some collagens have been extracted from plants, that's probably where a lot of the projects are left and haven't been utilized or explored for using hydrogels for tissue engineering. Um, and one that's becoming, I think, particularly of interest is recombinant collagens. So they're often termed collagen-like molecules or collagen-like proteins. Um, and that's because they're made from this SCL2 protein, which is able to form the triple helix, which is that hallmark feature of collagen. So in order to produce these recombinant collagens, um, you use genetic um, manipulation um, on a host, such as um, a plant, such as tobacco or a bacteria. Um, and you can increase the production of certain proteins and then harvest that. So there's a company called Coal Plant in Tel Aviv, and they're currently producing um, and selling some um, uh, tobacco, or sorry, collagen from the tobacco plant. Um, what one of the materials which I'm working with is a bacteria recombinant collagen from CSIRO, which they produce in house. Um, so it has a lower molecular weight than uh, animal collagens at around a third of the molecular weight, so 100 um, kilodaltons there. So we use it at a much higher concentration, um, around 15% weight volume compared to the animals, which we use around 3%. This one's water soluble, which is quite favorable when you're working with it, and has very high batch to batch consistency and can be produced in really large batches, which is convenient. So there's two main extraction techniques for collagen, um, and this produces two main collagens from the animals. So we see an acidic extraction or an enzymatic extraction. So the acidic produces a telo collagen, what we call it. So that retention of a telopeptide, which is really involved in fibril formation. So it helps fibrils form. And if you include pepsin, an enzyme, that cleaves a few more bonds and it gives us what we call a telo collagen. This doesn't form fibrils to the extent uh, that the telo collagen does. So a lot of people use rat, um, 
tail collagen in a lab. And um, when you neutralize and incubate that, you'll get collagens of various stiffnesses, depending if you have TLR or A TLR, and that can be really important depending on the outcome you work with. So different cross-linking techniques, um, they, they're existing. So fibril formations most commonly can be used. Um, and this um, involves the neutralization and incubation that's often the casting. But we also see in tissue engineering, some people do chemical modifications such as methacrylation, which gives rise to 3D printing techniques with rapid cross-linking. But what's of interest particularly is some novel approaches which combine some of these ideas. Um, in particular is a concept called fresh printing, which is a suspension extrusion bath. Um, and we saw here, very nice paper in science uh, two years ago where they printed a uh, heart, well, small heart here, and they print in a gelatin suspension bath, um, which allows it to be supported in that conformed fibrils. Uh, we can see here uh, in photo crosslinking techniques such as methacrylation, you get rapid crosslinking here, but that means you have to modify the collagen. So what other, the second and final point I'll say is modification of the collagen changes its structure, which changes its properties. So on the left here, we see unmodified TLO collagen can make these conform fibrils very well. The ATLO form, when it's pepsin extracted, can't form these fibrils as well. When we methacrylate either the TLO or the ATLO collagens, they almost completely lose their ability to form fibrils. So this can be really important when we're trying to understand um, and use these hydrogels gels for tissue engineering, including with, with cells. So the most significant progress in the field has really been driven by the abundance of um, sources of collagen and the crossing techniques which can be employed. But the biggest hindrances and difficulties working with collagen uh, include its um, scarcity. So it's very expensive and can be hard to source and extract yourself. And I would say secondly, is it's also quite unstable. So when you're working with it, you have to be very careful as well. Um, so in summary, I would say not all collagens are the same. You can get different sources, different extraction techniques, and following that as well, different modifications of that can change the structure and the ultimately properties of the collagen. So thanks very much to the team and thank you all to, to, to the ACES network. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any last burning questions for uh, the speakers? No. Yeah.